So uh, I think that uh, maybe the, what exactly a monad is was not clear, so I will write just a, a fully formal definition because I hope that the intuitions were there before, but I write a formal definition just so that it's clear what ingredients constitute a monad and what don't, okay? So what I am actually defining here is a monad in the category of sets. Don't need to, you can ignore this. So you could have monads in different categories such as, and I will use them actually later on, such as the category of two sorted sets, and even in the category of vector spaces or something like this, but let's have just this definition here. So a monad consists of four different ingredients, and uh, so it's a, First thing is, well, you could think of it as a function, but technically speaking, it's not a function because it's defined on arbitrary sets. So it's like, it's an operation which inputs a set and outputs a set. And typically, I previously called it star, but now I will call it T, okay? Uh, so you have to give, uh, and maybe I will trace it on an example. And actually, to be fully formal, it's, there's going to be two functions, both of which I will denote by T, so I will, to be for, fully formal, I will, in the formal definition, I will write them differently. So there's something called, maybe I'll call it T-set. Then you give a second function, which is a T function, which goes which inputs a function from sets to sets and outputs a new function from sets to sets. Uh, no, it's not a function from sets to sets. What are you trying to capture now? The first one was the star. What are you trying to capture now? The F star. Mm -hmm. F star. So now, let's, let it put it this way. You have a family. The family is indexed by functions. So you range over all possible functions from one set to another set. And for each one, you say, well, then I, let's erase this substitute here. You lift it. You give a function, maybe I would make it like this. And this function goes from Tx to Ty. I mean, isn't this basically, I mean, you move, it's a, it's a functor, so you have to move, you have it's to exactly move the ele elements and the arrows, right? Yes, it's exactly a functor. Yeah, but not everybody's familiar with the notion of functors, so. So these are the first two ingredients of a monad. So maybe here it would be, then I will write it maybe like this, it would be probably better. So for every set X, you provide a set TX, and for every function, you provide a transformation. That's two ingredients, and uh, there's two more. For every set X, you have to provide a function, 
and maybe I will formally index it by the set X because it's a different one for each set X. Okay. This one it goes from T of T X to T X, and this one goes from X to T X. It's called the unit. So in order to define a monad, you need to provide four things like this. Okay? So is it completely clear at least what are the ingredients of a monad? Now, as I said, they're subject to some axioms. You don't include that. That's, there's no, that's, mm. uh. So in the particular case of the, the, this, so an example, so here's the example, is the, it's called the, the uh, let's call it the monad star, sometimes called the list monad or the monad of, of finite sequences. This family, it's just X star. The function is lifted just pointwise. Flattening is defined in the obvious way, so a list of lists gets flattened to a list. And the unit operation, it inputs an element to a list of length one. Okay? Uh, okay, so that's a monad. And it should be subject to certain axioms. Once you have given a monad, so formally speaking, you have given all four of these uh, ingredients, you can define various notions. So one of them is a T-algebra. So let me write, rewrite it again. Well, it's going to be a bit of a waste of space. So the definition is Let T be a monad. So formally speaking, T stands for all four things, okay? I just use one letter T, but it's implied there's more structure than just that, okay? So all four things in the definition of a monad subject to the axioms that I have not given to you, okay? Then an Eilenberg moore algebra over T, because you need to say what is the, 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 this, the, 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 the monad that you're working with, is, is a pair like this, subject to these axioms. So, once somebody supplies you the notion of structure that is relevant to your application, for example, finite words, but it could be countable words or something else, then an algebra for that notion of structure, so it's parameterized by the choice of structure T, consists of a universe and a multiplication operation which inputs a structure labeled by M and flattens it to us and, and, and multiplies it to a single element. <laughs> and it should have the property that the one letter words get evaluated to themselves. And then if you have a structure of structures, then if you flatten it, so you, essentially if you have something here and you decompose it some way, it doesn't matter how you decompose it, the value will be the same. Okay? Subject, and that's, that's, the, that's the full definition of an algebra. I will also call these things uh, T algebras. So instead of saying Eilenberg Moore algebra over monad T, I will say T algebra. And now if you instantiate T to be the monad of finite words, you will recover a monad. 
if you instantiate, so let's, let's, what I would like to do now is I'd like to do a number of examples. So the first monad is finite words. So it inputs a set, produces the finite words over it, it inputs a function, and it will lift it to in, in the obvious way. Flattening, well, I just illustrated on an example, but we have already seen this. You just remove the parentheses, and the unit operation, well, it's <laughs> in this notation, it's even invisible what's going on, yes? It, 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 Inputs a letter, but it produces the one letter. Okay. Let's have another monad. Okay, let's start off with some very stupid monads. Non-empty words. It's also mono. You can lift a, a function to non-empty words. If you have a word of non-empty words, it's obvious how to flatten it. You just won't have such. And, well, you can good enough to do that, okay? But the strange thing, mono, mono is a semigroup with identity. So there is, a, and this is visible here, actually, because, so let's first, I will, I will, I will get to that in a moment. Uh, so it's non-empty finite words. Tell me, what is a, an algebra over this monoid? So what's an algebra over this monoid? A semigroup. If you think about it, it's what? There's a multiplication function from m plus to m. It's a semigroup. And this corresponds to the fan. And also, if you think about it, this is a submonad of this. You have to specify what that means exactly, but you can imagine that, well, this is a subset of this. Yeah? <laughs> no, it's a submonad. This monad is a special case of this monad. One has to say what it means to be a submonad, but I hope that it's clear that this is a subset of this, and it's good. And that, what that means is that if I have a, a, an algebra over this thing, I, have a, I need to define it, the multiplication operation, over a more general set of arguments. So if I have an algebra here, I can extract from it an algebra here by just restricting the multiplication operation to a smaller set of arguments. And it co will continue to be associative because it was previously associative. So there's some relationships like that, which corresponds to the fact that from every monoid you can extract a semigroup, not necessarily the opposite way, but actually you can, but uh, this is not true in, in general. So this is maybe a not an interesting example. So I erase it. Countable chains. It's a good example. You can lift a function, if you have a function over the alphabet, you can lift it to countable chains. We have done this already. Uh, if you have a countable chain of countable chains, we have already discussed this, you can flatten it to a normal countable chain, and clearly you can interpret every thing as a, as a, as a, as a chain. This one has to be careful. Uh, for example, chains of size at most three are not a monad. Because if you flatten a chain of size at most three such that each part of it is a chain of size at most three, the resulting chain will have size at most nine. Okay? But fortunately for ordinal numbers, the, for, 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 for cardinal numbers, this is okay. So chains of length at most continuum, that's okay. Uh, in fact, 
And this is technically not going to be, uh, let's have a fancy letter like this. This is all possible chains of whatever length, labeled by x, yes? Technically speaking, not a monad because this does not form a set. But apart from that, it's all okay. Yeah? So you can lift something like this and, you know, and you can do that. But let, let's forget this, uh, this, 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 this for a moment. Another example is going to be where scattered we already saw. I want maybe, okay, maybe you can write it. This is, if you remember, this is scattered countable. This is just countable. And the f flattening is in inherited from here. So if it's, it, what's important is that uh, if you, uh, uh, scattered is a hereditary prop property that in the sense that if you take a scattered chain of scattered chains and you flatten it, it becomes, it's scattered once again. This requires some argument, but if you think about it, it's true, okay? So if, if you chose some other notion, it, 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 this wouldn't necessarily be the case. Well-founded also has this hereditary character. If you take a well-founded chain of well-founded chains and you flatten it, it's well-founded again. No. Mm, no, maybe uh, later. Th th it's my, it is my intention to cover trees. Uh, let's do maybe two more examples. Uh, so well-founded. Countable or not, but in order for them to form a set, let's call them countable. No, we are okay example. And another famous example, oh, this, this, this is maybe the most famous, uh, one of the standard examples of a monad, is the power set monad. This is also a monad. But power, well, a power set is a more basic thing. So your notion of structure over uh, alphabet X is just an unordered set. Uh, it, it, it's a set, okay? Uh, clearly, you can lift, if you have a function on elements, you can lift it to sets in the obvious way. So, you know, you map A, B goes to F of A, F of B. So the size of the set might decrease because, you know, the function might, might join two elements. Flattening is kind of clear. Have a set of sets, you can just, re it's, it's, it's called the set union operation, yes? And uh, this operation, what's going to be the unit? Singleton. This is the one element. So this is going to be a monad. Okay, these are all examples. Uh, to answer Moshe's question, this will be the first of five three monads. Well, omega plus five. Uh, suppose I fix a ranked alphabet. Ah, before we do that, tell me what an algebra over this monad is. Exactly. So a set can be viewed, uh, well, not exactly, because you also need to have the infinite operation. That's yes, because you need to multiply an infinite set of arguments. You see, Pierre? But it's very, at least if, 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 uh, if the set X is finite, then you need to multiply every finite set. So you can view a set as a word, so it's like a monoid, but it's subject to the property that it doesn't depend on the order of the arguments and the multiplicities, so that corresponds to a commutative monoid, means the order of the arguments is important, and the multiplicity, that means idempotent. 
That's for, uh, for finite universes. But in fact, an algebra is allowed to have an infinite universe, and then it's, it's not exactly that, because you also need to say how the uh, multiplication operation works for infinite sets. No, but you can imagine. So I give you an example uh, uh, of an algebra, which is, is, is not like of a PI. Let, let, let's give an example. There's a let's do it. Here's an example of a P algebra. So what is a P algebra? We need to give a universe and we need to uh give, uh, uh, we need to give um, the multiplication operation. So the universe is natural numbers plus limit element and the multiplication operation So it inputs a set of arguments, and it outputs an argument, and this is just going to be max. Soup is a better notation. So we input a set of natural numbers, possibly including infinity, and then you just give the biggest one. So you could get infinity because you already had infinity, but you could also get infinity because you have arbitrary large numbers. Now if you think about it, it's associative, okay? So that's an example. And it's not determined by its finite parts. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's an example. Okay. Now let's do some uh, tree monads. Then that, a finite multiset is exactly a commutative uh, idempotent monad. And finite multisets are a monad. In the it's recognizable by finite allenberg moore algebra, you get the symbolism. No, no, you would you would get the regular languages, uh, uh, regular languages, but uh, uh, commutative regular languages, and there's very few commutative regular languages. Sorry, yes. Mm -hmm. So now let's give an uh, an example of a tree monad. So for this monad, it's not going to be one monad, but it's going to be one monad for every ranked set. So let's think a ranked set. A ranked set is like this. So it's an alphabet. It's used to construct trees. So you have letters of rank two, which are intended to have two children. You have letters of rank one, which are intended to have one child, and letters of rank zero, which are intended of to have uh, zero children, and namely beliefs, okay? So let me fix a rank set. Here's an example, letters A, B, C of ranks two, one, zero. And then, let me define the monad here. It's going to be trees over T of X is trees over sigma plus X. What does that mean? That means that I construct trees which are constructed from sigma but are allowed to use elements of x in the leaves. So you should, can think of them as, as terms over this alphabet with variables x. Okay? So a typical element here would be A, C, B, X, if X was a letter from X. But you could have X written twice, or it could be the case that you have two different variables. Okay? So that is uh, what my monad ma maps as sigma. 
So I will write, I will call this monad T sub sigma because it depends on sigma. So for each sigma, there's a, there's a different monad. And I hope it's kind of clear what, how you lift it to functions, yes? Because if I have a function which manipulates x, so transforms the x into some other set of variables, and I input such a term, I just rename the variables and I keep the internal things unchanged. So if I have a term over variables and I have a renaming of the variables, it's clear how to get a, a new term over the, the variables. What is the flattening operation? So what I need to have is something like this. It inputs, well, you have to use the monad twice. So it inputs a term where the variables are terms over the variables, and it's supposed to output a normal term. But this is kind of clear because what, what's the input? The input looks like this. It's a term. And now instead of variables, I have other terms. So for example, here I might have uh, b of x, and here I might have a of x, y, and here I might have a of something like this. These are my new variables, yes? Because this is, the variables are this, yes? How do you flatten it? You just remove these circles. You just remove these circles. Nothing going on, okay? Tell me, what is a monad? What is an algebra over this monad? So let me write it out, maybe. Simple. Let's fix this thing. And what is a T sigma algebra? Well, what is it syntactically? You need to supply a universe. Maybe I will call it to uh, strengthen your intuitions, I will call it big Q. Some set, maybe finite, maybe not. And I need to provide a function T sigma. Yes. This, if you think, and it has to be associative. What does associative mean? It means the following. Let's, let's I'm, well, I'm, I'm trying to understand this, this signature of this, right? Multiplication is an operation from? In general, the multiplication is an operation from the monad applied to the universe to the universe. So I have done this for this particular monad T sigma. Remember, it's, it, the monad, it's a different monad for every sigma. So I have fixed some sigma, and I, and I, 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 I did this. So at least it's of, of legal type, yes? And now, so this is a function which should input some object that looks like this. And maybe I will color the elements of Q in a different way. And it's supposed to map it to a single state. Yes? That's, well, I call it a state just to, <laughs> uh, I mean, what do I use Q? But it's not a random, so in, the type just says it inputs a tree where the internal, where, where it's constructed from the alphabet and it has these, these variables here and it maps it to a, it, it, it maps it down. But it's not any random function. For example, you will probably not be allowed to uh, do this to be uh, something if this is prime and something else if it's not prime because it has to be associative. And what does associativity mean? It means the following thing if you unfold this diagram that this thing, I could draw circles like this. Now it has become a, an element of, yes? And associativity says that what I could do is I could first fold, uh, evaluate it here, some state here, 
in some state here, and then evaluate it here, and it should give me the same result. This is a bottom-up deterministic tree automata. Because this is going to be uniquely determined by what it does over individual letters. Okay? So that's a bottom-up tree automata. Or an algebra in the usual sense. Depends on what you're... Because I used the word al algebra already, I think. So, so why didn't we get before DFA? Should have gotten DFA somehow when we... You could get DFA as an example. If you use, but in a, there's a, sl it's almost like this, but it's, 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 if you consider a slight modification, so DFA will be recovered. We had to get some term with X at the end somehow, exactly. right? So what you're going to use, suppose you want to model DFAs over alphabet ABC. Okay? Then what you're going to use is you're going to use a, a monad T sigma exactly as it's there, for sigma being A, rank one letter, B, rank one letter, C, rank one letter, and an additional end of input letter of rank zero. And if you think about it, then T sigma algebras over this are exactly the same thing as DFAs. Okay, so, so this is the beauty of this notion because it really covers uh, like all kind of algebraic structures that you can see. I mean, and this list can go on for a long, long time. So, yeah, because it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. okay. this is one notion of 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 of, of monad, uh, the tree monad. You could have other, as I said, lots of different ones. You could imagine a monad which inputs an alphabet and produces the possibly infinite trees. Here I just use finite trees. Now it's a very interesting story what goes on there. And, well, it's not an unfinished story. Okay, so now we, we, I gave you lots of examples of monads and their algebras. And the slogan is that, uh, uh, that any algebraic structure known to man <laughs> overselling it a bit, is actually a specific, uh, a specific instance of some, some, some model. Okay, now what's the usefulness? So you have a general notion of uh, a general framework. And what, what's the use of a general framework? Well, one should not oversell it. There's, you will not be able to prove combinatorial theorems at this level of generality. But one thing that you can do, at least, is to uh, uh, phrase definitions. So I told you what an algebra is. I I think I told you what uh, homomorphism is. Uh, so let's uh, do the following definition. Say, Mm, no, maybe put it this way. A T language is a pair. You provide a finite set, which is the alphabet of the language, and then you provide a set of words in the generalized sense. Of course, typically you just say L and the alphabet is implicit, and I'm going to do it like this, but just to, because we're abstract territory, I, I want to. Uh, so that's a, a notion of finite. So if you instantiate it to the monad of finite words, you get a finite word rank language, and you do it in other cases, you get other languages. Then we can say that it is recognizable. if there exists a homomorphism to 
this is what I'm defining, yes? This is supposed to be a homomorphism. And this is supposed to be a finite algebra. Technically speaking, in order to have a homomorphism, both the input and output should be algebras. But uh, if you remember, one of the axioms of a monad was that this is an algebra. Okay, so that you can write. And which recognizes it in the obvious sense. Recognizes meaning that if two words, in a generalized sense, have the same value under the homomorphism, then they're either both in or both out, which, alternatively speaking, can be said as Yuda is saying, you can identify an accepting subset here, and that's the inverse image. Now, so, so now let's look at the the most the, the let's say the most fundamental properties of. Uh, recognizable language, which is <coughs> Boolean closure. Let's do it. Let's prove it. <laughs> Where? Is it okay if I erase the definition of a monad, but keep the examples? I mean, well, the examples, yeah. <laughs> the example I think you can delete. No, I'd like to keep them because I want to... Oh, you want to go over them, okay. I want to, you know, just to, to keep them in mind. Huh? So. so one simple lemma is that recognizable languages are closed under Boolean combinations. And, well, complementation... I mean, union and, and intersection should be just basically because monads are closed under a certain Boolean operation themselves, right? But the complementation is the even easier one because you complement the accepting set. This is the type of setting where this works. Because, as you can see, you use the exact same homomorphism and you complement L, the property will still be true. So you just complement the accepting set and it's done. Trivial. Projection. We'll get there in a moment, but let me uh, just uh, mm, just uh, underline it that if you have two algebras, then there's a natural product algebra. This is what Moshe uh, just mentioned. So the universe is pairs, and you just mm, pairwise apply the multiplication operation. There's nothing going on. It's going to be associated. So in particular, uh, recognizable languages uh, are going to be closed under... Uh, Boolean, uh, Boolean combinations because th this is what's sufficient. Projection. You mean over the same monad, right? Sorry? Uh, over the same monad because. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. No, 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 over the same monad. So if these were both T algebras. Yeah, yeah, you take the same. This is also a T algebra. Okay? But there is also a very natural operation, power set M. What is it? Well, suppose that M, the monad, the, the algebra had a set M. So the homomorphic image of the, mon of the, of the, of the algebra. Essentially, right? yes. You had a multiplication operation. OK? And now I want to have a power set algebra. Nothing going on here. So the universe of the power set algebra is... Sets? It's a, so it's going to be basically a retract. Yes. And the new uh, you need to have... something like this. You think about it a little carefully, and what you do is, for every structure labeled by a set, so as you, take a, you input a structure so that the positions are labeled by sets, what you can do is, for every position, you can choose one element from the set, yes? You can do this in many different ways, but for each way you can do it, you can multiply it and get something. And that's your output set. 
Okay? I mean, you have to go through the abstract nonsense how to do it, but it's a very intuitive operation. And uh, what this implies is that the recognizable languages are closed on the projections. So they contain the so in. Uh, this is just, there's nothing going on. Uh, this doesn't say anything about decidability. Yes? Uh, let me maybe give you what are, what are theorems that you could prove. So what you can do is you can state definitions. You can state, uh, define that recognizable language. You can uh, define homomorphisms and so on. Uh, there are some theorems that you can prove. So I give you one example of a theorem. This is minimization. It's going to say that every language has a minimal algebra, minimal automaton. Okay. So what is a minimal automaton? Suppose I have a language L. Then I say that a homomorphism H. This is the minimal one. What 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 would that mean? What would what would the minimal homomorphism be? This is a purely categorical formulation that that that's very easy to write. It has to be a homomorphism which recognizes the language, so satisfies this property here. So one. So is I don't know. I uh, is the I would call it is the syntactic homomorphism of L if number one it recognizes L in the sense defined here and number two among those who would do recognize L it is the best one what number two says is that for every other F which recognizes L into some other algebra which recognizes. We want to say that this one has too much information. Or what that means is that there exists in G, which makes this diagram. This is a straightforward categorical formulation of, of being the optimal homomorphism to recognize. And you can prove that it's, uh, if it exists, might not exist, it's unique. Okay, this is, this is not, nothing going on here. Can't you do it even without, without the language? Just if you just look at the, I mean, it's, there is, just like you have a concept of a core in a graph. If you have a, a monoid and a, and a recognizing set, yes. you can look at the, at the there, is, there will be a canonical That's after, after so isomorphism homomorphic image that does, so not, does not make new elements to the unit. What, would, what could happen, what you could, uh, uh, there's, there's several ways of doing it. Uh, one of them, there's several uh, uh, benign generalizations of this. First of all, it doesn't need to be a set. A set, a subset is a two-valued function, yes, no. It could be a coloring, yes, no, absolutely yes, uh, certainly not a four-valued function and it's the same thing. I mean, you can recognize a four-valued function and that's okay. Uh, second of all, it doesn't need to be a, c a coloring or subset of the free algebra. It can be a subset of any algebra, not necessarily free, finite, for example. Uh, so the, 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 the more general notion is you have a function from some algebra to some set. And then you can, that, 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 that's as, as far as it goes. And here's a theorem. It's not difficult to show. Uh,
every language has a step. This theorem, as stated here, is false. There's an assumption that is needed. I first illustrate the counterexample, and then I will state the assumption. So, uh, I will not state the counterexample very precisely, uh, but if you take a language of infinite words, there exist languages of infinite words which don't have optimal algebras. You can identify more and more things. If you go to infinite words, you can come up with such examples. For finite words, it's, it's not the case. Every, every language, not necessarily regular, has a minimal automaton. That automaton might be uh, you know, infinite state, but it always exists. Uh, however, if you go to infinite, uh, infinite languages, then you can come up with languages so that you can have uh, algebras which are smaller and smaller and smaller, but they don't have a well-defined limit. You cannot go to the limit. So this, this, this theorem does not work for infinite words. I mean, one will have to be precise. But it doesn't work in here, or here, or here. So to make the theorem true, we need some uh, assumptions, additional assumptions. And there are two assumptions which would make it true. Number one, we would say it's not any language, but it's a recognizable language. That would make the theorem true, regardless of the moment. But uh, a different way to make it true, and this is the one that I'd like to focus on, is that it's also true for not necessarily recognizable languages, however, assuming that the monad only produces finite objects. It's called something called a, f a finitary monad or finitary monad. I don't know how you say it. Uh, and well, I have to say what it is. But the intuition is that monads would create inf uh, uh, finite structures. But here is the beauty in, uh, of, of, of category theory, that there's a very nice one-line precise definition of what it means to be a finitary moment. It's this one. What does it mean? So a monad in the abstract sense it inputs a set of labels and produces the structures over those labels. What does it mean to produce only finite structures? Well, the answer is this, that if you only produce finite structures, then even if your input alphabet is infinite, every structure you will produce will use a finite subset of that alphabet. And that's the defining property. So T is finitary if for every structure over some possibly infinite alphabet, there exists some finite set as that W belongs to that finite set. That's what it means for monad to be finite. This is in the ca for I have used only the category of sets that the, 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 this definition can be made more general, but I can say this. So which of these monads are finitary? Finitary? So you input a set of, 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 of variables and you produce the, the, the finite terms over those variables. Finitary, you use finite, finite terms. So you, can you produce <coughs> words. Even if your alphabet is infinite, every word is going to use finite. Many words. Finitary? No. It's countable words. Uh, otherwise, it would be star, yes. <laughs> so it's countable words, so you're, it's not going to be finitary. Again, if you produce, uh, even if um, you know, a scattered countable words, it's also not finitary because you can produce a word which uses infinitely many letters. Uh, Well-founded countable chains, again, the same, same, same issue. Power set monad, finitary or not? No. I mean, you can construct sets which have infinitely many elements, OK? So some are fi fi finite, some are not. So this theorem, if you assume it to be finitary, you will always have minimal automata for every language, minimal algebras. These algebras might not be finite, because not every language is regular, recognizable, but they will always, there will always be optimal ones. And uh, bef I will end very shortly, uh, but maybe I'd like to 
write something here. This is if and only if. In the sense that if your monad is not finitary, then this will fail. So for every infinitary monad, you can come up with a language which does not have a minimal algebra. Okay, so it's exactly the property uh, which is needed to make this work. So these are the types of things that you can uh, make work. What's another type of theorem that, that, that's true in general? This correspondence between compositional functions and homomorphism into algebras. That is abstract enough to be true always. Another type of thing that's, all, that's true for arbitrary monads, at least over set, is something called the Eilenberg theorem about pseudo-varieties that pseudo-varieties of algebras are the same thing as pseudo-varieties of languages. If you know this, then, then, then it's, it's, it's true. So th there have been like tens of papers which prove this theorem for uh, you know, finite words, semi-groups, uh, omega semi-groups, and so on and so on. It's, it's just the same thing. Other things that are true for arbitrary monads is the notion of profiniteness and some theorems about that. So there are certain results that are just true complete abstract setting. Yes? Can you make an example of the language which has this property? So it comes from finitary monad, which is not recognizable, but still it factorizes in its way. You mean a language which is not recognizable but has an... Uh, uh, has a syntactic algebra, yeah, this should be simple. Oh, you mean uh, a language which is uh, over a finitary monad, which is, uh, uh, okay, so, you're saying a language over a finitary monad which is not recognizable by has a syntactic homomorphism? So an example is every language, because the theorem says this is true for every language, but let's uh, unravel it. So for example, if we take the palindromes, If you think about the Michael Nerodi equivalence relation, uh, and this is viewed as a subset of AB star. So we want a monoid homomorphism which recognizes this language. And if you think about it for some time, this corresponds to establishing the, the two-sided Michael Nerodi equivalence relation for this language. And this, if you think about this for some more time, then actually this is a trivial uh, uh, equivalence relation such that every two different words are, uh, uh, every two words are different. So the syntactic, the, syn the syntactic homomorphism is the identity. You cannot identify any two words because you, for every two words you can, you can find an environment such that it will uh, make a palindrome problem. Uh, uh, so maybe the last thing I wanted to say. So just to comment, it looked to me like the the, the omega words are the problem child here. They're not so much. So the mon omega words can be modeled as monads in at least two two different ways. They're both inelegant. So they're but there are small problem child. You know, uh, like. Uh, a little graffiti here and there, no, no drugs. Uh, so one monad to model omega words would be this. You input an alphabet and you output uh, words of length at most omega. And then you need to produce the flattening operation and you do it in this stupid way Sure, you, you to go to the first tail and then exactly. you the That's one way, and that would work out. A different way, which is more elegant, is you use two sorted sets. So I presented the definition in sets, but in, it also makes sense for two sorted sets. So, so what happens if you, let's say, you take this formalism, you take this approach, and now you, you want to do, uh, you want to show, let's say, uh, so first of all, what's the what do again closure? Cl I mean, I mean somehow, right? Because closure and the projection really should correspond somewhere to determinization. So before what we showed was the subset construct can essentially give us determinization, right? That's what we showed before. No, I don't think that's that that's true. Um, mm, if you take an MSO formula and compile it into an algebra, which you can do using these these naive methods indicated over here. 
But basically, to deal with projection, you have to do subset construction, right? Yes. So the, the, this, this, if you take an MSO formula, compile it into an algebra, in the meantime, we're going to do nested uh, subset construction. You get some algebra. And, but there, it, it, you, it's not easy to, uh, from this algebra, there's no clear way of how to uh, uh, extract a deterministic algebra. Uh, because how would you extract a deterministic algebra? Because all of the power of the algebra is what happens in the limit. And it's not so easy to see how to do this. Uh, so this helps you nothing with McNaughton theorem. Uh, however, uh, if we take, for example, this particular monad, then using the same uh, proof as we had on the slides, you will see that if I have an algebra, then uh, and I have a fixed set of generators, then I want to know what are the reachable elements, then all I need to do is I need to close it under multiplication on omega power. And furthermore, every algebra for this monad with a finite universe is uniquely determined by these two operations. And this is uh, what's known as the uh, uh, Wilke theorem. I mean, it, this is what Wilke proved that if you, uh, all you need to know is these two things. Wilke did more, I mean, he said, if I give you multiplication, if I give you a universe M, multiplication tables for these operations, uh, then, uh, the theorem that I just mentioned says that there's at most one way to extending it to, a, to an algebra. There might be zero ways because it might be non-associative somehow. What Dilke showed is that he gave a system of equations, infinitely many but uh, finitely presentable, such that which say exactly when you can uh, extend it to, to, to such a thing. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm confused. I thought we I, I had minus five minutes. I've got half an hour. I can do yeah. <laughs> Well, I will. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I will. No, I will not do graphs. But I, what I will do, I, I present to you uh, what I want to. Okay, I, I just do what I'll do. See what. The first thing is. Ah, uh, oh, shit! I, I, I erased the definition of recognizability. Uh, I think. So I rewrite it once again, and I want to point out some very important thing in it. Remember it said that L is recognizable if it is recognized by a homomorphism into some finite algebra. I didn't say what a finite algebra was. Okay, so this is a question. What is a finite algebra? This is an algebra. It's a set and the multiplication operation when is finite. So a very natural definition is an algebra is finite if its universe is finite. Okay, that's a good place to start. But, and it works in many places, for many of the examples. However, just by saying that the universe is finite, that doesn't say so much. I mean, you would expect finite algebras uh, to be something that you can input to an algorithm, for example. Yeah? If I just say a finite algebra is one where the universe is finite, that says nothing about representing them. Uh, so alone, the finiteness of the universe is, 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 is not enough. Okay? It so turns out, and in many interesting cases, such as the monads written here, based on the results that I pr presented in the previous lecture, finiteness of the universe alone, by combinatorial reasoning, implies that you can represent it in a finite way. There's no reason why this would have to be true in general. So for example, if you uh, take uh, MSO over the real numbers, which is undecidable, you could very well consider a monad 
such that t of x is chains labeled by x of size at most continuum. Continuum. Why not? And it's a, it's a set. You can uh, flatten things. It's all well defined. If you take the function which inputs a, a, a chain and you associate to it its k type for the same reasons as in the previous lecture, it's a compositional function. And for abstract reason, every compositional function induces an algebra. So the set of k types over countable chains is an algebra. For the same reasons as usual, it has finite universe because there's finitely many k types that you could write anyway. Okay. And using this type of thing, you can even well at least compute its universe. So it's a finite algebra, and, and well, you can say what its universe is. Unfortunately, there's no way to do anything with it because uh, if if there, if there could be algorithms doing certain things, I would need to say what exact things you would need to do. But there, if, if, if it was really uh, finitely representable, you would be able to decide MSO over the real numbers. So it's, it's probably the thing that we you kind of a bit skipped over, which is how do you go from small types to type of small unit to bigger type? That's probably the part which is non-computable, yeah. maybe. What is non-computable here? Yeah. I mean, you, before that, we kind of inductively build the, the set of all yes, the so satisfiable well. types, right? We should not be able to do it here. Yes, because this definition alone comes with no theorem of this form. It so happens that you have, in some cases you have such theorems, but it so happens that in other cases there are no theorems about in inductive things in a computable way. So that's the problem. You can formalize what you need. So what are the ingredients of the monad that are necessary and sufficient for MSO decidability? But uh, it's, 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 you can do it. Uh, so the, just finiteness alone does not imply that something is representable. Okay, and now in the last uh, 15 minutes or 20, I'd like to uh, present, maybe I'll just go to a monad for graphs, present you an example of a, a monad for graphs. However, for that, uh, I will need to use not monads over sets because the algebraic structures will naturally have multiple sorts. So as a stepping stone, I will present to you now a special type of monad for trees, which will have two sorts. Okay? Uh, so I provided previously to you the definition of a monad, uh, which said it inputs as a set of labels and it produces the set of structures over that set of labels and you know does other things. Now imagine that all the objects we're manipulating are two-sorted. Okay, so it inputs a two-sorted set of labels and produces a two-sorted set of structures over those labels and so on. And I'll just illustrate this over the following example. And then after that, I will pass to graphs. So the first example is going to be a monad for trees, and it will have two sorts. And then the monad for graphs will have infinitely many sorts, which comes with its own problems. So suppose that I have two sorts. So I am no longer in sets, but I am in two sorted sets. And then, so each set, each set a, a two sorted set is a set such that every element has sort one or sort two. Okay. And uh, to make things a bit more intuitive, I will call this, uh, well, uh, it will, the sorts will even have names. The first sort will be called forest, and the second sort will be called context. So these are two sort names, okay? So like you have two sorted structures, like I don't know, what's a classical two sorted? <laughs> Uh, and uh, so 
So you, uh, a, a, a two-sorted set for me is going to be a set such that uh, every element is, is, is identified also. Uh, is, it, is it forest or sort? Okay. So formally speaking, a two-sorted set is a set X together with a sort function or maybe just a, a pair of sets. Okay, that's a two sort. The monad is as follows. Suppose I get an, uh, a two sorted set, and just for the sake of concreteness, let's use this one. So I have a set with two, two elements of each set. Now, I want to apply this monad to this. It is also going to produce a two-sorted set. Okay? What will be the elements of context type? And what will be the elements of forest type? I illustrate one element of forest type and one element of context type, okay? And then you will <laughs> generalize it to other examples. So an example of an element of forest type is this. So what I have drawn here, this is one element. It is a forest, so it's a set of trees. Actually, it's an or I, I, I think of it as an ordered forest. So there's a notion of left and right. Okay, so there's the first tree, second tree, third tree. It could be an order that, that would also be okay. Such that the context letters are used as non-leaves and the forest letters are used as leaves. Okay? Let me give you an example of a context element. And there's no arity restrictions. So you could have three children, you could have one child, but uh, if you're a context element, you have to have at least one child, okay? And an element, example of a context element is what? The same. Sorry, A. a. So you draw ah. wait a minute, something wrong with my picture. So I draw a forest, but you apart you also add a port with the intention of adding things. Okay, is this clear what the, the, the... Single one or several four? One. One four. There's a, you could have several, that would be a different moment. Context of now is a forest with a port. A for, it's exactly, a, it's, it's a forest with a port. And now what I want to sh uh, define is the multiplication operation of the monad. So what is it? An operation which Which that, that's the type. Yes, let's read this. It's a. F this is a two-sorted set, so it inputs a forest or context, such that the alphabet is forest or context. Yes, and then it produces a forest or context, and it should be type preserving. So if it inputs a for an element of forest type, it outputs an element of forest type. And, and let's just draw an example. So suppose that the input.
So what should I do? An input and they're not overlapping. So an input should be this is an example of a forest input. There's no ports, yes? These are the nodes, leaves and non-leaves. And in each node, I have a label like this, yes? Of appropriate type. So if I have a forest node, then it should contain a port. If I have a context node, it should contain a context. Yes? So something like that. Now I redirect my arrow. It's a bit more clear. And I'm starting to get lazy because it will take a lot of time to draw this. So I could have some degenerate context here. Uh, sorry, I, I, I messed up my letters by now. That's an example of such a thing. So inside each blue box, I had to give a, a context, and inside each, gr each green box, I had to give a forest. Yes? So tell me, how do I flatten it? Is it clear? Just delete the bubbles. If I delete the bubbles, then this line, it splits into two lines. Yes? That means it actually gets uh, three children. Yes. And here. Just deleting one. Okay? So that's an example of a monad. I mean it satisfies the axiom and so on. I should also give the unit and etc. An algebra over this particular monad is something called a forest algebra. So it's a type of algebraic structure to study uh, languages of trees. Okay, so what we have seen here is a monad over two sorted sets. Now let us go to infinitely sorted sets. Okay, and this is going to be the graph. This is not right. Is it the same uh, class recognized by this heterodoma? Yeah. <laughs> so, in what you've drawn inside your contexts, blue guys have children and green guys don't. Yes. In your context on the right, green guys have children and blue guys don't. Uh, here was a mistake. This, this, this was mis uh, I should have inverted the colors. Sorry? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So now, let's... So a follow-up question. Can you obtain this forest algebra by combining the rank three algebra that you saw before with no, no, not really, no. You, what you should do is you should combine the string monad with itself in a certain way. Mm. So there is, if, 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 if the word you're looking for is distributivity law, then you can do that. But you use, use the string monad twice. Uh, somehow. I don't remember exactly how. Let us now give a monad for graphs.
So the monad for graphs, this is something due to Bruno Cursel implicitly. I mean, I'm dressing it up as a monad, he didn't do it, but the idea is of Cursel. Okay? So we're going to have an infinite sorted sig uh, signature. So there's going to be sets of rank zero, rank one, rank two, and so on. Let's give an example. Now I think I would not do the colors because this will just kill me. So let's suppose I have Mm. a ranked alphabet. So now we are in the category of sets, which of infinitely sorted sets. So every element has a sort, which is a natural number. I call it the rank of the element. So it could be 0, 1, 2, and so on. So let's give the following, consider the following ranked set. So it has two elements. One of them has rank 2, and one of them has rank 1. Formally speaking, it's a it's an infinitely sorted set, such that only two sorts are non-empty, the second and the first one, and each one contains one element, okay? And now, we can view this, it's literally as a relational signature. So we have one relation symbol of arity 2, and one relational symbol of rarity 1, okay? And let us construct a relational structure over this signature. This can be viewed in this particular case as a directed graph, that's the relation E, with some distinguished nodes, that's the relation B. Yes? So it has some nodes. It's directed because it has a first argument and a second argument. Could go both ways in principle. And then, you know, So we can construct a relational structure. However, a monad is supposed to map a ranked set. It's supposed to preserve the category. So it should out uh, input a ranked set. So I have said it's, it's, a, it's a relational vocabulary. But you should also output a ranked set. And then there should be the substitution, which I will discuss in a second. What is, so I need to give ranks. So an element. of rank zero is a relational structure. What's an element of rank one? It's a relational structure with one distinguished element. No, I, I don't use the circle. What's an element of rank two? It's a relational structure with two distinguished elements. So some of them are anonymous, like this dot here, and some of them are the distinguished elements, okay? So the monad is this. If your input is a relational vocabulary, okay, then the rank k elements are structures over that relational vocabulary with k distinct constants. They're different ones, okay? Now, let us do the flattening operation. So what's going on here? What's your input? Well, your input has a certain uh, rank. So suppose that your input is of rank, say, 2. What does that mean? It means it is a relational structure. So it has three non-distinguished nodes and two distinguished nodes, one, two such that the vocabulary is T sigma. So what does that mean? You have one relation name for every object like this. Okay, so let's draw them bubbles. So for example, here you could have a binary relation connecting this and this, which would correspond to the relational structure, I don't know.
And I will, uh, what I will do is, uh, I will draw, instead of writing E, I will draw a directed edge. And instead of doing B, I will draw a self loop. Okay? But you're also allowed to use ternary symbols. So what's a ternary symbol? It's a re relational structure over our original vocabulary with three distinguished elements. So I could have one here. So I could have a ternary symbol applied to these three elements corresponding to something. and so on. So I create an element of T, T sigma, is a relational structure such that the predicates themselves are relational structures with distinguished elements. How do you flatten it? You erase the bubbles, okay? Nothing going on here. So if we wanted to flatten this, then just erase the bubbles. Okay. It's a very straightforward uh, monad. This is what he calls graph grammars? This is essentially what he calls graph grammars. Uh, there's two types of graph grammars in Kursel land. One of them is uh, vertex replacement and the other is hyperedge replacement. This is the hyperedge replacement version. So, uh, so yeah, that's uh, one thing I mentioned. Uh, if you allow me, I will go maybe three minutes over time. I will maybe give one more thing that you can do over a monad, okay? In, in the general, a definition you can provide in, in general over a monad to relate it to, to Coursell, which is this. What is a context-free grammar over a monad? So suppose I have a monad T and an alphabet sigma. What is a context-free grammar where the terminals, so the input alphabet is sigma? Well, it's nothing else than you provide a set of non-terminals n, and you provide a set of rules. So you provide a set of rules of the form a non-terminal and what it rewrites to. If you think about it carefully, this is exactly a context free grammar. If you think of it uh, in terms of, of uh, if the monad is finite words, this is a context free grammar. If, it, if your monad is, uh, is trees, then it's a tree grammar. And if your monad is this monad, then it is a Coursell uh, uh, grammar uh, in the hyperedge uh, replacement style. And if you do it in vertex replacement style, you can do it. Uh, and so this, I think, is a transparent language to, 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 to recover some of uh, Coursell's ideas. For example, you could ask, and maybe this is the last thing I wanted to say, and, and, and I would end, what's a recognizable language here? Well, a recognizable language, allegedly, is going to be Recognized by homomorphism to an algebra. But what an algebra? Unfortunately, an algebra here is a set M which is infinitely sorted. And if you think about it a little bit, you can see that you cannot have, all of the so sorts have to be non empty. And each truly at least of two elements typically, at least. So it's going to be inherently infinite. I mean, uh, and it's not exactly clear what it means for an infinitely sorted algebra to be finite. Uh, one naive idea would be to say it's finite on every sort. This doesn't work. 
So it's a it's an interesting question. I mean, for 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 the Courcel case, you can solve it. Uh, you can identify. I mean, you can understand what it, what the finite algebras are supposed to be. But there are uh, settings where it's not clear, and I think mm, infinite trees are, are are a case where where the it's completely unclear what a finite algebra is supposed to be. So maybe I would like to end here. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I can see your tiles. <laughs> yes, Lorenzo? So if you take as the monad the probabilistic monad, which kind of language is there? Uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a, oh, good question. I don't know. So you mean probability distributions over the set? Yes. I guess it should correspond to some kind of probabilistic automata, but uh, I, 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 I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, then, uh, so I'd like to thank all of you uh, for coming here, and uh, uh, we'll go for the picnic now, but in case you're not going, I'd like to say goodbye, and I'd like to once again thank Moshe and Joel, who, who already had to leave, and Stefan for giving the talk. <laughs>